You did not get born onto this earth for the sole purpose of being liked by everybody. If you are somebody who everybody likes, you've not said anything that's important. You have not said anything of impact. Hey there, this is Patrice Washington from patricewashington.com, where we chase purpose, not money. Welcome back to another episode of Redefining Wealth. And if you're brand new, here's what you need to know. This is a community that believes that wealth is so much more than just money and material possessions. We believe in the 12th century definition of wealth, which is the condition of well-being. And so every week, We focus on well-being in six pillars, and these are the areas of life that impact our finances, even when we're not thinking about it. If you need to get caught up, and I suggest you do, head to patricewashington.com forward slash start here. Again, the pillars can be broken down for you at patricewashington.com forward slash start here. Before we dive into this week's episode, it's brought to you by our Redefining Wealth private Facebook community. Yes, we have a community of purpose chasers from all over the globe. I don't believe that greatness can be created in isolation. You need people and you need like-hearted, not just like-minded folks around you. So join our free Facebook community at IamAPurposeChaser.com. You'll get to meet purpose chasers who are near you. Yes, in your own country, wherever you are. You can suggest show topics and guests and even get early access to upcoming events and programs. Purpose chasers always know first. So join us at I am a purpose chaser.com. In this week's episode, we are talking about what fear is costing us. I know so often we desire to be obedient. We want to do the thing that is on our heart to do. We want to speak up. We want to take a stand. And yet fear keeps pushing us back down. It keeps muzzling our voice. It keeps silencing us. And so I invited someone who I know is amazing at talking through these things, not because she is perfect, but because she's made a decision to continuously push through the fear that comes up every time. And she has some great examples of how that has really supported her as she continues to pursue her purpose. So today on the podcast is Lovey Ajayi Jones. She's a New York Times bestselling author, speaker, and podcast host who thrives at the intersection of comedy, media, and justice. Her debut book, I'm Judging You, the Do Better Manual, was released to critical acclaim, hitting the New York Times bestselling list at number five. Her new book, Professional Troublemaker, the Fear Fighter Manual, just dropped a couple days ago on March 2nd and is the topic of our conversation today. Without further ado, here is Lovey Ajayi Jones. Welcome back to the Redefining Wealth podcast, Lovey. Good to be back. Man, you're only one of like maybe three people that have been here twice. Hey. hey, yes, I'm super excited. So I have a new way to introduce myself to you. Now, yes. I don't want to butcher this, so I have it in my phone. Okay. Tell me how to pronounce this. Is it Oriki? Oriki, yeah. Oriki, okay. So since the last time you were here, I have introduced myself differently because I've been reading your book. Yeah. And I said, you, honey, you got to come with it. So let me tell you who I am. Yes, I am Patrice May of House Washington, first of her name, mm-hmm. pusher of purpose, lover of wisdom, commander of stages, dope podcaster, mistress of peace and prosperity, God's favorite, Belizean baddie, princess of petty, master of resilience. Let's go. I love Let's it. I am go. here for it. I love it. I love every bit of it. Yes. I was up reading your book. And that made me sit up. I said, I got to introduce myself with a bit more authority. Okay. Come on. Let's just start with that. Tell us about what an Oriki is and why it's mandatory. Yes. And Oriki is a hype mantra. It is in Yoruba land. I'm Yoruba girl from Nigeria. And Oriki is something that ties you to your ancestral lineage. It's something that reminds you of how dope you are. It's like, it talks about whose you are. And I just think, It's something everybody needs. So I borrowed from Game of Thrones, how they used to introduce people. I was like, that's an Oriki. 
you know, there's so many traditions of how we hype ourselves up, especially in the diaspora. I said, it, you can see it everywhere. So I said, you know what? Everybody can create their own Oriki. Let's borrow from the Game of Thrones style. You know how they used to talk about Khaleesi was the breaker of chains, mother of dragons. When you hear her be introduced, you gassed up. So I'm just like, what happens <laughs> when we have something like that for ourselves? So yeah. yes, like mine is like lovey of House Jones, seller of bestsellers, okay? <laughs> I think I called myself the Dame of Diction. Mm -hmm. All right. The Assassin of the Alphabet. Sorceress of Side Eyes. I just feel like it just makes you feel good to hear that reflected back to you. So like, I hope as a result of people reading my book, everybody writes their wiki. Everybody puts it somewhere they can see. Or you know what? Sometimes you might even wake up in the middle of the night and be like, let me remind myself of who I am. You right. I'm fly. I'm fly. Listen. So I'm so glad that you wrote yours <laughs> and introduced yourself like that. I'm over here gassed up on your behalf. Yes. Okay? Come on. I had some keynotes to record today. I had to look over that thing. I was like, ma'am, you are commander of stages, whether they are physical Let's or go. virtual. This is Let's what you go. do. That's, that's love it. it. I love it. So you already know, I loved your last book. I loved I'm Judging You. You had me cackling out loud on the plane. I will never forget. People were looking at me like, are you okay? I felt the same way, but this time I was in the bed at home and only my husband was like, I guess it's, I guess what you're reading you like. I kept trying to read him things, but he needed more context than I had time to give. I was trying to get through the book. But your new book, uh, Professional Troublemaker, the Fear Fighter Manual, you say that it is the how-to to to I'm judging you's what. Yeah. It's like the continuation. So listen, if you've never read I'm judging you, I'm just going to tell you, you're going to want to order the new book. Just get the old book to go with it. Just so you can go ahead. Like read it like a series. That's, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? You mean you ain't got to, but you should, but you but ain't you got should. to. But I wrote it. I, I write my books to stand by themselves, but that they basically speak to each other. So professional troublemaker is the big sister to I'm judging you. You know, I love I mean? it. It's the elevated version of how you're going to do what I said you should do in book one, because in book one, I said, we need, we need to do better as humans. We got to figure yeah. out why we do trash things because we're all a mess. But book two is saying we're all a mess because we need to make more trouble. We're going to have to do the things that scare us to make more trouble. And making trouble looks like disrupting for the greater good, challenging rooms that we are in. So they're elevated as a result of us being in there. You know, it's being audacious with our dreams and daring to Mm -hmm. think that our lives can look massive and, and, and can blow our minds. So I'm excited for people to get their hands on this book because I think this book is going to loan people power in the moments that they need it. Right. Like you were about to go on your keynote stage and you're like, shoot, I, I might need something to gas me up. Reflect back to your Ricky and remember who you be. <laughs> right. So what's the difference between a professional troublemaker, though, and an everyday troll? Because some people are mm-hmm. out there trolling and they're like, I'm giving my opinion. I'm standing in my truth. But yeah. they're also just saying stuff. Yeah. Like just what's the difference? See, that's where the professional comes in. Right. <laughs> That's where the professional okay. comes in. A professional doesn't do things just for the sake of doing things, just to be a contrarian. A professional troublemaker is not just being a troll and being a hater. This person feels deeply convicted to be responsible for what happens around them. Right. I think intention is where it comes in. Trolls, we don't talk to them. We, we're not about them. They're not here to disrupt for the greater. They just want to disrupt, period. Yeah, and distract, deter. And distract and, mm-hmm. and, and throw some, some bombs for the sake of it because they want to hear their voice or they just want to create chaos. A professional troublemaker is like, I actually want to keep chaos from happening. So mm-hmm. that's why my voice is needed. You know, a professional troublemaker saves a company from creating a terrible campaign, Pepsi. Okay. A professional troublemaker keeps a company from being prejudiced against their black employees by saying, Hey, we, this is not where this is going to stand. A professional troublemaker is the person who says, I'm going to fight for my friendship because I will have that tough conversation. Right. Mm -hmm. As opposed to holding it in. I think the idea of making trouble In this world right now, (laughs) making trouble means you're probably on the right side of history. Making trouble means you're probably the person saying, hey, let's actually not be transphobic. Let's not be hateful shrews. Let us make sure that the people who are typically not given power are given voice. So troublemakers are the ones who are shifting rooms and making sure the thing that needs to happen is happening. The contrarians are people who are just talking just to be heard, Mm. who are just disagreeing for the sake of disagreeing. 
If I disagree with you, it's because I deeply believe that what I'm saying will move something towards the good. Yeah. And so what happens when that's your heart, that's your spirit, that's what you would like to do, but you're fearful. You're too afraid to stand up and say something if you're in that room of decision makers at Pepsi or if you're in any of these spaces or if it's just your own social media platform and you have six followers, whatever it is. How do you stand up? Because what I hear a lot is like, but people won't like me or what if people say this or do that? So what do we tell So first of all, it's easy to be afraid. It's natural to be afraid. And I think that's why I really wrote this book to focus on fear. Fear is a universal feeling, but we attach guilt and shame to it. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to not, because here's the thing is, you can't even be courageous without fear being present first. If you weren't afraid, you weren't not courageous. Courage, right? It's not courage. So the yeah. fear is necessary. So you're being a human by being afraid. However, you cannot let the fear be what is the decision factor in how you will move forward. If you are moving off fear, you're not going to do, do that thing that feels big or scary. You're not going to say that thing that feels big or scary. So you just be quiet. Now, I feel like there's a troublemaker in all of us. The mm-hmm. problem is it's been silenced out of us. Mm. It's, been abu- it's been abused out of us. It has been insulted out of us. It has been shunned out of us. So then we decide, you know what? It is easier for me to be quiet. And then you wake up one day and realize you don't even know how to tell the truth anymore because you haven't practiced it. In the small moments, you don't have the practice. So in the big moments, you definitely don't have the language to even say, I want to say this thing, right? What we're usually afraid of in those moments, though, is that we will rock the boat. Mm-hmm. And we will lose our sense of belonging. We will stop being a part of the tribe of that room. The tribe. Right? And humans, we have a core, deep need to belong. So we will do anything sometimes to belong, including betraying ourselves. We will often betray ourselves to belong in a tribe. If you have to do that, you shouldn't be in that tribe. That's not the tribe for you. That's one. Two, you, don't, you did not get born onto this earth for the sole purpose of being liked by everybody. Mm. futile mission. That is not possible. If you are somebody who everybody likes, you've not said anything that's important. You have not said anything of impact because here's the thing about having and, and being a person of value. When you have very strong values, it means you will repel certain people. Yeah. Just naturally, just because of what you believe in, certain people will actually be repelled by you. They'll be like, I can't, I don't like them. Don't like them at all. That's actually good because when you repel certain people, it means you will be deeply loved by others Mm -hmm. because you'll be speaking their language. You'll be speaking their thoughts and ideas. They'll be like, I feel you. I relate to you. I connect to you. Here's the thing is we're so constantly afraid of repelling people. We're so constantly afraid of not connecting with the people who are not our people. Right. Don't spend enough time deepening our connections with those who are. So Mm -hmm. in that room, when you're speaking up and it's tough, think about the people who are your people. You're speaking for them. You're at the table. So you are the one who has access and the power to speak in that moment. They need you to speak for them when they're not there. So when you're afraid during those times, you have to start being like, what's my purpose here? What's my mission here? What, What is my fear keeping me from doing? And will I be proud of my silence? Ooh, will I be proud of my silence? Will I be proud of my silence? I, there's so many times where that convicts me. Yeah. I'm, mm, yeah. Yeah. Will I be proud? If I walked out that room and somebody asked me, what happened in that room? And I tell them and they say, so what did you say? And I say nothing. Will I be proud of that answer? Yeah. That is so good, lovey. I just had an experience and I know you've been doing your stuff. Usually if I have a little uh, injustice in the professional place, I'd be like, I'm a drop lovey a DM. I don't know why I always think of you because you are the spearhead of people being raggedy with sometimes how they come at uh, black creators. Yes. Speakers or any of those things. But I had a situation recently where someone basically offered me an opportunity to be a part of their platform. Very well-known, established, credible, all these things. And when they first reached out to me, they were gassing me up, right? Like, 
oh, like you and us and being in alignment, this would be so great. And it would come with this podcast and a book thing and like all the things basically replicating my entire business. And then I'm like, cool, well, let me like, let's talk about it. Like, as long as you know that I'm not going to jump back in a straight up money box, I need to be who I am. And as long as we're clear on that, let's talk about it. And they sent me the offer. Mm. They sent me the offer. And I was like, clearly there's a comma and a zero missing. Because I don't clearly got me messed up. Like, I don't even understand what this is. Like, I literally have to send it to my husband. Like, hey, read this. Am I misinterpreting something? Like, am I missing words? Or do you think a word was omitted? Like, I'm confused. And when we got on the phone, I said, is this an offer that you would make to a white man with the same credentials that I have? Ooh, what they say. <laughs> Couldn't talk, grasping for air. Oh, that, that. So, well, 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 wait a minute. No, you wait a minute. You came to me. You I did not come looking for you. Came in Black History Month. And it was Black History. I said, that's not what we want to do to a Black woman in Black History Month. <laughs> in or the any year, month, let alone. Let alone. Or any month. You hear but, me? But. In walk, I could have just said, no, I could have just said, no, this is not a good fit. Thank you so much for the offer, whatever, whatever. I could have said anything, any number of things to stay in good graces, but we chose to say, is this an offer you would make to a white male? Because I want you to think twice before you even jump in another black woman's DM or jump in another woman's email box. You came and found me. I did not come and look for you. Come on, homies. Say something this ridiculous and essentially asked me to replicate my seven figure business for mm-hmm. five figures with oh. your brand attached to it the so disrespect. that you would make millions and I would make peanuts. And the thing, and I'm just sharing that to say, the thing that I'm proud of is that I said something so that I hope you will think twice before you even utter such disrespectful numbers to another mm-hmm. woman. And another black woman, don't try it because had I just walked away, I think they would have just tapped the next person and been yes. like, hey, yes, this is, here's a garbage offer. And if that person was not secure in what they've already created and who they are, they might have taken it thinking it's a good thing. Mm. You know what I'm saying? But it's that. I'm so glad that you said something. And that's an important piece to dig into because We spend a lot of time being afraid of ourselves Mm. or for ourselves, not thinking, well, who am I supposed to be fighting for beyond me? There are times when I don't, I might not have the courage to stand up for myself, but then I have to put myself in the context of, but if I don't speak up for me, then I'm also being silent for others who look like me. Mm -hmm. I'm also not using my power in this moment for those who might find themselves in this same situation, but might not have the same leverage I would have. Mm -hmm. So I think sometimes when we take ourselves out of the equation, it also gives us courage to know that my voice right now as I advocate for myself is not just, I'm not because I'm advocating for lovey. Mm -hmm. I think about when I saw my first book deal, Patrice, my first book deal was not good in terms of the advance that I started off with. Oh, it was trash. And I knew but I accepted it because I was like, I'm going to accept this and prove this point, prove, prove whoever did not think I am worth more, mm. prove them wrong. Because then if I prove them wrong and this book does well, publishing will actually be like, oh, snap, black girls who are not famous can sell books. Let's, mm. let's give them some money. And that's what I did. That's why I put book one on my back and was like, I will do anything I have to to make sure this book flies off the shelves because it will go beyond me. It's bigger than me. And sure enough, when the book came out at number five on New York Times bestselling list, I'm judging you bumped down a New York Times columnist. Mm -hmm. One changed a lot to where when I was going for book two, so book one, only one editor ended up bidding on it because the rest of the editors thought it was too risky. Mm -hmm. Book two, it was a 12 editor au- auction. Wow. Come on. I have chills. Come on. Auction. And I got to pick the final three. It ended up on final three. And I got to say, I want that. 
And I ended up at the best publishing house in publishing with the best team possible who has laid out the red carpet all on the back of that first book one. Yeah. And I had to push myself past my comfort zone because I knew that the book was bigger than me. For, when, for the times that we are in these rooms where we want to say something and we are afraid, I want you to think of who else are you speaking for beyond yourself? Get some courage from the idea that your voice is being used in service for others. And I think uh -huh. that will sometimes infuse you with more courage because a lot of times we will do whatever we can for other people, but we won't do it for ourselves. Yeah. So start thinking about yourself and how you show up in service of others. And it'll make it a little bit easier to be uncomfortable because you'll know it's helping somebody else out. That's so good. So you had these times where you knew what you had to do, but then you had these times where even your fear got the best of you when you turned down that tech talk. Yes. Indeed. Not once, but twice. And then you did it and went on to have 5 million views and counting. Ain't that right? crazy? That's crazy. <laughs> so how do you know if you're turning something down just because of fear or if it just wasn't your time? Good question. If your reason for doing it is really that it is not time for you because you know you're not ready and you're like, I can't do it. I don't even have it. Then, OK, you can say no. But I, I honestly think a lot of times it's not that. If you said no and it went away without you thinking twice about it, it's not yours. If you say the no and it's clean break and you like, I ain't even thinking twice. Easy, not yours. But if it went away and you're sitting there like, should I have done that? Odds are there's something there that you missed. I think we miss a lot of our growth opportunities and, and think they're no opportunities uh. because we're afraid. For me, my TED talk, the reason why I turned it down, I was like, I ain't gonna have time for that. I, I'm busy that, week, that, that fall. I ain't gonna have time to get ready for a TED talk. I won't, I won't have enough time to, to build a talk that I can kill like that because yeah, I'm doing a lot of things. I'm not ready for that stage. That's why I turned it down. The second time I was like, well, I already booked the day. So sorry. But it kept on coming back. It kept. So the third time that it came back, it was three weeks before Ted. Three. 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 And when I was like, you know what? I, I just want to come to cheer on my friends because I have to be at a conference the night, the day after, because I was emceeing a conference and keynoting that same conference the day day after the first day of TED. And I was like, you know what? I can come on day one just to say what's up to my friends, be in the audience and clapping for them, being a loud voice that's affirming their, their talks. And Pat Mitchell was like, well, if you can come, I want you to speak. And I was about to turn her down a third time. I'd already written up the email and I called my girl Unique. And I said, yo, this is kind of crazy. They want me to do this TED talk. It's in three weeks. And I said, everybody else has had a coach for the last four months because Ted don't play. Yeah. Ted does not play about who gets on their stage. They will run you through a script. They will get your coach. They will have you rehearse on their stage. It's a whole production. They make sure those talks are high quality for a reason. So when I called Unique and I was like, yo, this is kind of crazy. I'm about to turn it down again because I just, everybody's already had all this opportunity to perfect their talks. And at this point, I'll have to write a brand new talk. Mm -hmm. And it's the three weeks away. That's wildness. And I'm expecting Unique to be like, yeah, you right. Unique was like, everybody ain't you. Ooh. <laughs> Get me together. She was like, everybody ain't you. Because your credentials has been your coaching. The fact that you've yeah. been on the stage every three days has been your coaching. You're prepared for this. So I want you to get off my phone, write your talk, and kill it. Bye. And she hangs up on me. She didn't even give me a chance to be like, but wait. <laughs> <laughs> she hung up on me and I was like, well, shit, I've heard what I got to do. So I wrote that talk. Funny enough, I wrote it in an Uber because I was still afraid. I was still afraid. I was, I was headed to another flood trip because between those three weeks, between that three weeks and when I had the TED talk, I still had five or six trips. And Ted wanted my script. So I was like, you know what? Let me go ahead and throw something together in this Uber on the way to, to the airport to another flight. 
And they'll probably say no, which is cool because they'll make the decision for me <laughs> in a moment of self-sabotage or attempted self-sabotage. So I wrote the talk as I'm pulling up to the airport, I sent off the talk, land in whatever city I was going. And I had an email from them. We love it. It's great. I was like, wait, what? Y'all like this talk that I wrote this Uber? Okay. Every time I looked for reasons for them to turn me down, they did not. They did not let me say no. Mm. And then I got on that stage at TED after scrapping my talk the day before. They didn't know. I scrapped half yeah. my talk the day before, rewrote it at two o'clock in the morning, memorized it on a flight on the way to New Orleans for TED. And I stepped on the stage and had like an out-of-body experience. The TED Talk that people see is the TED Talk I gave. There was no editing magic. There was no ums. I didn't forget any sentences. It flowed out of me as if I'd given that exact talk 15,000 times. It was like, Uh, I didn't even realize I'd memorized it. I just thought I was still going to riff. No, I... What I did on that stage even blew my own mind because I was like, how did I just do that? I didn't even know this talk yesterday. Yeah. And I remember because I still had my flight to catch. Like I, They made me opening speaker of that TED when I said I had a flight to catch. They were like, no problem. You just be our first speaker. <laughs> they were like, madness. Are you serious? So when I said thank you and I ran off the stage, the stage manager stops me and turns me around. And was like, I need you to see the standing ovation you're getting. Uh. And the whole room was on his feet. And I was like, holy smokes. And I said, thank you again. I ran off stage again. I jumped into the car that had my luggage in it. Made it to the airport. And I was like, I killed it. Yeah. I killed it. And I think about my TED Talk. And it's such a life-changing moment for me for so many reasons. One, a week later, TED was like, we're going to feature this talk on December 1st. It was the first talk from TED Women that was featured on TED.com. In a month, it had a million views. Wow. And that talk every day has gotten me an email or a message in social media that's like, hey, I read your TED, I watched your TED talk and it made me do this thing or it shifted Mm -hmm. the way I think about something. I've gotten countless speaking engagements from that TED talk. Like that TED talk is my biggest lead magnet for speaking. And... The other thing about that talk is it really, the talk itself was a testament of what I talked about in the talk. In it, I talk about how fear stops us often from doing or saying what is our purpose. I almost let fear stop me from saying yes to Ted. And it made me reflect on like, how many times have we let fear Talk us out of the things we are actually supposed to do for real. How many times have we Uh, let it say, how many times have we said no to yes opportunities that can transform our lives because we were afraid of whatever it was? How many times could our lives have been different when we, if we chose courage, especially when we were afraid? And I was like, this is, this is a big thing that we all have to really focus on. And I realized that in the moments where I either didn't let myself make a decision because of fear or other people didn't let me. It has changed my life. Like anytime I do the thing that I've been like, yo, that thing sounds so scary, but I something that's pushed me towards Mm -hmm. it. Anytime I do it, I win. It's like the story of every time, every time it's been, that's what like the man that I'm married to. The reason I'm married to him is that I pulled his beard at a party. I never done that. <laughs> Come on, Mr. Jones. Okay. That is, <laughs> that is, it was so out of my comfort zone and so out of my usual. And it was like God driven because it was like me, typical pragmatic sit on my, you know, like feet on the ground. Me, I just let things come to me or I'll find reasons why it's too big because ah, that's not possible. But here's the thing is pragmatism doesn't do us any favors. Mm. In this world that's asking for us to be audacious to get anything done, feet on the ground can only take you so far because if you keep on being rooted to the ground, how are you going to fly? Like, yeah. how do you fly when you always are rooted into the ground and you don't think big and you don't, you know, think about doing something that makes you uncomfortable? Yo, you're going to keep on having this gray version of life that's not yeah. 
that interesting. What I also hear in it, though, is the blessing of obedience, because Mm. a lot of times these are things, these are opportunities that God brings to us. And you're the one saying, no, well, God, are you sure it's like if you're looking for a sign, this is it type of thing, like you prayed for it and then things show up. And then it may not look exactly how you wanted it to look or come on the day that you wanted it to come or you feel like I need to have X, Y, Z lined up before I can say yes to that. And God is like, ma'am, I put it before you, like I allowed this chain of events to happen. I keep putting you on the heart of man. Like I've already gone before you and prepared the table and you're the problem because you're giving in to whatever judgment, shame, guilt, embarrassment you have. And it's already done if you just do your part. I love that idea. We basically put limits onto ourselves. And and one of the things that I really see us do really well is that we have this limitless ability to think about how things can go wrong. We build dragons in our heads, like we create them and our fears take up a room because they start small and all of a sudden we blow them up. But we don't have the same limitless imagination for what if they actually went well? What if the best case scenario happens? But we're constantly opting out of the best case scenario because we're afraid of the worst case scenario that often never never comes. We will come up with catastrophe. And if I say this, then this thing will happen. And the next thing you know, you homeless. You're like, how you get there? <laughs> you get to homeless. How you get to that? So we create these massive, just wild imagination about how awful things will go. Yeah. How does it shift if we actually say, this could actually go really well? And again, it's something that even I fall into. It's something that's so easy to human nature to constantly think about the bad things. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's work that we all have to do, which is why I'm like, I tell people, I was like, listen, I wrote this book for myself. Mm. Right. Like I wrote this book for me and I feel like I'm letting other people read it. Even in the process of me writing Professional Troublemaker, I'd be writing and I'd be like, oh, yeah. Are you, are you reading yourself for filth right now? Is that what you're doing? I'm like, mm-hmm. yup, sure am. Like, I want people to understand that even I still struggle with a lot of this. I wrote yeah. this book to remind me. Of yeah. the moments when I'm being limitless about cynicism and I'm thinking about, ah, what if it goes wrong? But what if it goes right? Yeah, there is nothing like reading back your manuscript. You know, when you're in the writing process and you have these seasons of like, okay, you're going back and making edits. I was reading my book one day and got myself together. Like, and it happened to be a section where I was genuinely struggling like that week. And I'm like, ma'am, you had all the answers when you wrote this, I don't know, three, four months ago. How did you forget this? It's like, I don't know, selective amnesia. So I love having it. I love even saying things on the podcast because sometimes it'll take even my child or a listener to be like, hey, but you remember when you said, Mm. oh yeah, I did say, ah, I thought I was talking to you, but what I realized is I was talking to future me, future me. I didn't know that I would really need that in that way. So I love it. So you talked about unique and I want to go back because we talk about the people pillar a lot here. And you talked about how to build a squad in the book Mm -hmm. and you wrote friendship is about showing up as needed to the best of your capacity And you break down relationships into these five categories. And I wanted you to kind of touch on some of the categories um, for having in the squad. So you started with the day ones. Why do we need day ones? We need day ones to keep us humble. (laughs) Because they remember us before we had any of these ideas about anything, right? They remember us when we was looking raggedy before they were stars. You know what I mean? Like they are the anchor to who you used to be because who you used to be is also necessary to who you are right now mm-hmm. and who you going to be. So you need the day ones. All right. So after that, who you got? The professional crew. Professional crew. You meet them at the conferences, at work, you know, the cohorts that you end up being a part of. And they actually end up being a really big part of your life because before COVID, you were seeing these people for eight hours a day, possibly, or more. Y'all are hanging out after work. And a lot of times your professional people become your actual friends in a different way. Mm -hmm. You know, they're looking out for you. They're the ones who's covering for you if you're late. 
you know, if you missed the report there or they took notes in the meeting and made sure you saw it. And they're all important because they are a huge part of your professional development. And then you have the mentors. Mentors are not your little friends. <laughs> OK, your mentor is the gateway who's kind of like looking out for you in ways that you might not even realize. They're the ones who can make one phone call and get you a job interview. They're the ones you call and tell them the number that was offered to you at that job. And they say, nah, ask mm-hmm. for this. Here's how you negotiate. The mentors will nominate you for stuff that you didn't even know existed. And you go, word? Damn, hi. You need the mentors because they lead you. You always need teachers, you know, <laughs> lifelong student over here. Yeah. What's your thought about virtual mentors, right? So, We've always known or heard about the mentors at work, like people you can reach out and touch. But I know you probably have a DM full of people who are like, can you be my mentor? Can you be my mentor? Can you be my mentor? How do you see that in a virtual setting, but then also with people who are practically strangers? I say no. Here's the thing. And I deeply believe that mentorship is not a relationship you can ask for. Mm Mm-hmm. Mentorship is a relationship that is organic. You can't walk up to a person and say, can you be my mentor? Well, you can. I don't think you should. Right. I think a mentor is somebody who you have access to, who has Mm -hmm. opened the doors of communication. It's not a formal one day you say, can you be my mentor? They say yes. And all of a sudden that's a mentorship. No, there are people who've never used the word mentor who are mentors to me. Yeah. There are people who can call me who we've never said mentor, mentee, but I can send them a mentee. Who are the people who you can call today who will be honest and transparent with you, who will share numbers with you, who will give you access? You already have those mentors. Now, a lot of people talk about the DMs of it all. Hey, love you. I follow you for a long time. Can you have, be my mentor? No. But there are a lot of people who are in my DMs who I am their mentor because they talk to me often. They'll ask me a question. I'll answer right back. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I think we can have mentors who we never even realize are our mentors just by listening yeah. and watching how they move. That's a mentor right there. Somebody who I can be like, bet I'm learning from you right now. I have friends who I consider mentors because I know that I can always learn from them, that they can give me job advice. Like my friend Bose, for example, like me and Bose are besties, but she's also one of my mentors mm-hmm. in that professionally, I trust her implicitly, even as I do personally. So who are the people who you trust who are in your realm? I love your mentors. Yeah, I agree with you. I have a lot of people I've never met in my life, but I consider them to be mentors, even from a distance, because I'm watching. I'm learning. I listen to the podcast. I read their books. I, I look at their YouTube videos and I learn what I can. And people say the same thing to me. And I'm like, well, if you have a question, just shoot me a question. Like I Mm -hmm. answer people's questions in the DMs all the time, but to call it a formal mentorship, I don't know what your expectation is. We're not going to talk every Tuesday at 2 p.m. One of my mentors, we have monthly catch-ups, but again, we work our way there. You don't all of a sudden one day become, oh my God, we have to start doing this thing. But the other thing about mentor-mentee relationship is what can you do for the person whose time you're asking for? Right. Like, how are you being of value to them? It's not saying that you got to do tit for tat, that you got everything got to be reciprocated. But for me, I'm always thinking through what value can I bring? If you are Mm -hmm. a mentee or want to be a mentee of somebody who's busy, the best thing you can do is offer up something, some time. You know, hey, for example, right now, somebody wants to be my mentor, my mentee. Them being like, hey, Levy, I know you're launching your book right now. I would just love. Is there any help that you need? Actually, no, even better then ask him if you can help. Tell them where you see a gap and say where you can help. Mm. Hey, I noticed you have this book tour happening. Do you have somebody who's managing the your own, you know, um, social media? Can I actually, I can help because here's my credentials. <laughs> that person can end up being my ment- mentee. One of the people who was on my team for a year is my mentee. Like anything she needs, what you want. When she was working with me, and she was in school. I was like, what do you want to actually ultimately do? Well, let's invite, let's, let's get you an intro to that person. Mm-hmm. That's because she'd proven that she was of value to me. She was proven that she was vouchable. Mm-hmm. That's important. And I trusted that if I put my name on the line, she wouldn't embarrass me. Come on. 
that part. Have yeah. you proven yourself to be vouchable? Because if I'm going to, if I'm going to recommend you for anything, I got to make sure you're not going to embarrass me. Straight up. <laughs> That's huge. Okay. The other people on the squad play group and true blues. The play, the play group. <laughs> These are the folks you're going to Tulum and Cancun with. <laughs> okay. Some of them are a lot of your friends, but like, you just have a good time. They help you escape in this world. You know what I mean? They, they're the ones you go kick it with when you're just like, I got to let my hair down. I got to chill. Like I need some, I just need to have a good time. And a lot of times you meet them in college, you know, college yeah. is the place where you go meet your play group for real <laughs> <laughs> because everybody ain't got no sense at that point. And then hopefully you evolve, but yeah, the play group is still essential. Yeah, definitely need it. And then the true blues. The true blues, yo, it's that tight, tight, tight knit circle, the besties, you know, the people who you count on implicitly to show up for you, to tell you the truth, to have your back, all of that. And I think the true blues are, again, they're not going to be 15, 30. I mean, if you have 30 true blues, that's weird, but hey, do you? But, <laughs> you know, the true blues, that's that's the squad. That's the circle right there. And the thing about all of these groups is there are some people who are going to exist in multiple of those groups. Right. You know, there's some day ones that, that will remain true blues for you. There are some people who you might meet in college or at work who actually end up becoming some true blues because y'all end up really connecting. There's some mentors. OK, who would become a true blue because you're like, yo, that's my homie. Mm-hmm. Right. Even though they're my teacher, they're my homie. And I think uh, we need all these types of people in our lives. The problem is that we always expect everybody to fit all of those things. That part. No, no one person can fit all those things. If some, if one person does that, that is exceptional. But I don't need my best. And exhausting. My play group. And exhaust. That's so tiring. <laughs> God, I got to see you at work. And then I got to see you like when we on, on the family trip. Yeah. You know, and then I got to also now see you. Oh, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's so a I lot. Think, just give give people the chance to fit where they fit. Okay, so this is the last one. And I, I really don't know how I feel about this one. You said everybody needs to get a Nigerian friend. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, well, wait a minute. First of all. Yes. First of all, you know, as a little Belizean American girl, um, what I have come to believe, however, is Nigerians are so close. Y'all don't want new friends. Like, do y'all want new friends? Do you want friends in the squad that are outside? Of, I, it, it don't feel right. <laughs> Some of my true blues ain't, Niger- ain't Nigerian. I think everybody needs a Nigerian friend. We we just, we so rowdy. <laughs> you need that rowdy. And we so rowdy. Like, we just... In every way, you got to go to one night, at least one Nigerian wedding in your life, yo. Like, if you ain't been to a Nigerian wedding. I haven't been to one yet. Uh, it's on the list. An Indian wedding and a okay. Nigerian wedding. Let on the list. Indians are Nigerians of Asia. And Nigerians <laughs> are Indians of Africa. I Absolutely. We have so much in common. I went to an, an Indian wedding a year before mine. And I was like... This is a Nigerian wedding. This is a Nigerian wedding. All of the extraness, all the colors, all the clothes, all the food, the jubilation. I'm telling you, you got to go to a Nigerian wedding or an Indian wedding once in your life because the way we do weddings and parties in general, we're so extra. (laughs) Like, we are so extra and it's such a good time. Like, you got to save your energy for a Nigerian wedding. It looked like your energy, your money. Uh, save space for food. It's a lot of saving that needs to happen. Oh, absolutely. Um, it's expensive. Listen, trust me. I know this because my wedding, had, I had two weddings in one day. It was a lot, but we had a good time. And people still like, can y'all do a vow renewal because we are ready for another one? I was like, <laughs> y'all got vow renewal money? Like, <laughs> you need a Nigerian friend in your life. We add spice to it. We add suya seasoning and Maggi cubes. We just- Listen, well, if you're yeah. not following Lovey on Instagram- and you or Facebook and you don't have a Nigerian friend, this right. could be one of the close ways, <laughs> the closest way that you can experience. Look, it, my book you will are be very Nigerian spicy. Friend. Your book will be the Nigerian friend. OK, yes. and this is this is the last thing for real. What I love about the book is the homage you pay to your grandmother, who yes. I believe is the original side eye. 
story. She is <laughs> the, yes. the original. And I love the way that you spoke about her because it reminded me so much of my grandma. Yes. And one of the things I did at IGTV about this um, probably last year or the year before, but that when I think about my grandma um, and how matter of fact she used to be, just mm-hmm. like let your yes be your yes, let your like your no is your no. Like she could love you and cut you up like in the same sentence. And you'd be like, well, damn, am I... Was it a hug or am I bleeding? I feel like I, I got a, like she cut me in the throat or hit me in the throat yes. and, you know, and held it and wrapped it up for me. I don't know how I feel. And as I was reading about, um, you know, your grandmother and the love that you show her in the book, it reminded me so much of my grandma. Why was it so important for you uh, to pay homage to her in this yeah. way? And how has that inspired you to be on this journey of like, you know, being a professional troublemaker. Yeah, I mean, I think all Black women are the original professional troublemakers. <laughs> they don't take anybody's crap. They are not here for your foolishness. And they're not shy about letting you know. And I love it about them. Like, they are, like my, my grandmother was just unapologetic about taking up space, about being celebrated. Uh, who was going to check her? Not nobody. Like the same energy that she used to love you, she used to lambast you. But it was so deeply anchored in love and kindness. And how she moved through the world, a lot of us reflect that our grandmothers do the same thing. Like it is a universal story about, about grandmothers, especially Black grandmothers. But I'm like, what happens if we have that energy before we turn 65? Listen. What happens if we move through the world without apology? before we become gray? What happens if we stop being ashamed about how we show up before we have to get an AARP card? You know what I mean? Like that audacity, that that I've lived enough and you can't tell me I'm not worth being here, energy, we can have that today. We ain't gotta wait for 40, 30 years. We don't have to wait for that. That's why, why should life pass us by as we're bowing our heads just because we are who we are. No, I need the energy of my grandmother today. I need us, especially black women of today, to carry that uncheckable in a Mm -hmm. world that's constantly trying to find ways to demean us. I need us to be like, I'm not receiving that. I'm not internalizing whatever you say about me. How our grandmothers act, let's start acting like that now, okay? Girl, I'm so here for it. Braun. I don't know what it is, but I'll be 40 in a couple of weeks. And baby, I've been letting everyone know. Let them have it. <laughs> it's a few things that's not about to continue, right? I've already started to cut them off, but it's going to be a hard full stop. I'm giving you grace. I'm giving you time. I'm letting you know because I don't want you to be thrown off. And if you are thrown off, you're going to have to deal with it. But you I do feel do. it. I, I feel that energy already. I don't know. I see a lot of women say that, honey, when you turn 40, lots of things start to change. There's definitely some things I started to release in my 30s, but I don't know. 40 feels like a whole new listen. It's a I'm refresh, not here for it's a it. reset. It's a chance to start over in a way that's like true to you. I think 40 is a good reset. That's it's really a good. good. Reset. Let, let people know you do not have time for the foolishness. They've been hearing about it. More, more to come. More to I support, come. <laughs> I support it. Okay. I am a supporter of that. Okay. Yeah. So before I let you go, I'm going to ask you some redefining wealth, rapid wisdom questions. It'll yes. be interesting to see yes. how those have changed in the last couple of years. Okay. So here's the first one. How do you define success now? Ooh. Success is living life on my own terms. Love That's it. That's how I define it. How do you define wealth in three words or less? Freedom of choice. Oh, that was good. Come on. I usually have to be like, hey, friend, that was seven words. Bring it down. Freedom mm-hmm. of choice. That's good. All right. What's one book that has helped you redefine wealth? Hmm. Whoa. Doesn't have to be a money book. It's just That's I was thinking like do. wealth. Hmm. Honestly, one of my favorite books that just in the last year that I've read is Glennon Doyle's Untamed. Because if we think about wealth as freedom of choice, it's freedom to be who exactly we are. And her book is all about how we need to be less tamed about who we are. So I would say Glennon Doyle's Untamed. She's one of my favorite people on I Instagram. Love her. her and Abby crack me up. They're all, hilarious. All their like, little stuff cracks me they're up. They're <laughs> so funny in real life. Like that's them in real life. 
I so, love it. Mm-hmm. I love it. Okay, fill in the blank. My name is, and to me, the truth about wealth is. Hmm. My name is Lovia Jai Jones, and the truth about wealth is that it's attainable for all of us. We're just going to have to do scary things to get it. Now, Amen. scary things doesn't mean bad things, by the way, just so y'all know. It doesn't mean unethical things, but I think it's going to ask for us to be bold about our dreams, about our wants, about our desires without shame. Yeah, that's good. Thank you, lovey. So glad to have you back on the podcast. I know the audience will be blessed. And I know that, let's see, this episode comes out two days after the official release of the book on March 2nd. And I know it'll already be like beyond a bestseller by then. We just going to add to it. it. We are claiming it. Okay. (laughs) Listen, it's going to be epic and I'm excited about it. You should be. And thank you for the conversations that you have that we will never hear about, that you may never put in a book or talk about in social media. But we know that for women, in particular women of color everywhere, you're advancing things on our behalf. And because you showed up unapologetic in the spirit of your Nigerian grandma, we will have bigger and better and richer opportunities because of the work that you do every day. And I appreciate you for that. Thank you so much for wanting to share space with me. I never take it for granted. Thank you for the love that you've shown me over the years. That Black girl village is real. And I just deeply appreciate you, how you show up, how you are using your purpose, how you're using your voice and making sure you're just deepening all these connections and freeing people. Because listen, the fact that you're giving people tools to be free financially, you're making generational change. So thank you for that. Thank you. All right. Did you not enjoy that conversation? Oh, so good. And I really love that Lovey told the truth about the TED Talk and what it could have cost her. Like when you really think about how now it's the you know, the number one marketing tool for her as a speaker. And we didn't say this earlier, but I'm talking, Lovey has been on some of the greatest stages, both physically and virtually, from everyone from Google to Facebook, Amazon, and Twitter. The fact that that talk, not doing that talk, may have prevented her from all of these incredible opportunities, it really does make you think about what could I be missing out on? Like, who could I miss out on being a blessing to? What am I not seeing that God has already laid out for me because I'm allowing fear to have such a hold, such a grip on me, the fear of rejection, the fear of failure, the fear of judgment, for some people, the fear of success. And it's not, I say this all the time, it's not about waiting until you are fearless, right? It's about moving in spite of, like going forward, knowing that, you know what, I may be afraid, but my ancestors, as Lovey talked about her grandmother, right? My ancestors are with me. So many people came before me in order for me to have this opportunity. There are people who are coming behind me who need to speak up and say, who need me to speak up and say, you know what, that offer isn't good enough, or I'm not going to tolerate this in a relationship or any number of things. What is fear costing you? Because when I think back over my life, I recognize that fear in different scenarios have definitely cost me my freedom. Freedom in so many different ways, mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally, financially. And it's just not something I'm willing to compromise anymore. And I hope that you're not either. Listen, if this episode spoke to you, I have a gift. And see, anyone who clicked off and they're like, I don't want to hear Patrice's commentary at the end, they are missing out on a blessing. After Lovey and I recorded that episode, I actually purchased 25 tickets to her virtual book signing going down March 11th, 2021 at 7 p.m. Central to give away to 25 of my purpose chasers. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep, all the details are in the Redefining Wealth Facebook community. 
free Facebook group. Go over there. If you want to be entered into the drawing to get one of these tickets to join Lovey, Gabrielle Union, myself, because your girl will be on there for this wonderful conversation about the professional troublemaker, then come on over to the Facebook group. The post with instructions will be pinned to the top of the announcement so that you can enter. We are going to choose winners by Tuesday, March 9th, so that you have 48 hours to get yourself together. We'll choose winners on Tuesday, and I'm going to see 25 of my Purpose Chasers over there supporting another wonderful author and friend of the podcast. Does that sound good? I hope so. So if you're not in the Redefining Wealth Facebook community, you are missing out. I really don't know what you're doing out here by yourself. There's a lot of purpose chasers from all over the globe in that group sharing, contributing, just being resourceful, being resources for others and loving on each other. You're missing out. We're missing you. So come on over. I think that's it. That's it for me. The countdown begins, you know, to, to my book too, <laughs> Redefine Wealth for Yourself, will be out March 15th. The countdown begins. I'm super excited about that. I'm super excited about my birthday coming up. I'm super excited about Lovey's book, Jamie Kern Lima's book, Barbara Houston's book, all of the books. This is such a phenomenal year for women authors. And I really hope and pray that you will support as many of them as you can, not just to support them just because, but because the work is going to actually be a blessing to your life as well. I'm just excited to be included in the lineup right now. It's great work going on out here. But anywho, until next time, I want you to go live your life's purpose, find fulfillment and earn more without ever chasing money. Talk to you later.